All right, good morning, everybody. I think we're just going to get started. I think it just just turned to 8, um, just so we can get finished on time as well. Uh, it, it's, it's so nice to be able to give two talks within like a four or five day period. Um, and I, I resisted the urge to talk more um, and elaborate on you know, our research in Raver and, and uh, VEGF. We'll, be, we'll talk a little bit about amblyopia this morning. All right, so just kind of some of the basics about amblyopia. Amblyopia is, is a unilateral, or this can occur uh, bilaterally as well, a reduction of best corrected vision uh, that cannot be attributed directly to any structural problem within the eye or the posterior visual pathways. It's caused by abnormal visual experience early in life, and it, it typically affects central vision uh, to a uh, much more ex uh, of an extent than peripheral vision. And studies in animal models and humans support the concept of critical periods for sensitivity in developing amblyopia. And the critical period, the timing of that critical period, and um, also the sort of the degree to which amblyopia develops uh, depends on the specific type of the abnormal visual experience. So amblyopia is a big problem. It is the most common cause of unilateral vision loss in childhood. Um, it occurs in a significant number of children, uh, with estimates ranging up to 5% of children in North America. Um, it's the most common cause of monocular blindness globally, and untreated amblyopia is estimated to um, cause over $7 billion in uh, loss of U.S. Uh, gross domestic product annually. Um, the major causes of amblyopia, this is in order of uh, decreasing frequency. So the most frequent cause is strabismus, followed by um, anisometropia or large refractive er relatively large refractive errors um, can cause bilateral amblyopia and uh, stimulus deprivation. So one of the most distressing parts of amblyopia, if we think about it as eye care providers, is that in principle, most amblyopic visual loss, all of this, this visual loss that we talk about, should be treatable or reversible if it can be detected in a timely manner and appropriate interventions can be uh, initiated and completed. Okay, so not only is it frequent, but it can cause severe vision loss. And um, there are many obstacles to successful amblyopia treatment. Compliance is a big factor. We, we run into this problem all the time in, in uh, clinic. There are problems with the compliance with patching, spectacle lens compliance. And this, you know, despite us you know, spending a lot of effort trying to educate parents and, and, provide, and uh, uh, people who provide care for these kids about the importance of the, the disease, its severity, and the length of treatment that may be um, required. Um, in a lot of situations, it seems like people just don't understand this, and I we think that that contributes a lot to, to this poor compliance and, and um, lower success rates in treatment of amblyopia. Amblyopia also has a fairly high recurrence rate, so it's important to continue to watch these kids and initiate therapy Again, if, if we see signs of recurrence, and this is quite a high rate, you know, one in four is estimated to show some degree of regression. And unfortunately, this is, this is the big, one of the real big problems is that many cases go unidentified, right, until it's, until it's uh, uh, treatments are not as um, successful for sure. Okay, so, um, we're all familiar with this picture. The, the visual system has just this remarkable um, property that corresponding areas between the two eyes are perfectly parallel all the way back from the nerves through the posterior visual pathways and even in the visual cortex, which is oriented in these really amazing parallel ocular dominance columns. If, if we look at these ocular dominance columns, um, at birth, they are, that you can see organization into these ocular dominance columns, but they're largely overlapping. And in response to normal development, there's pruning so that these ocular dominance columns become a better defined. 
They're less overlapping, but there is some overlap that still exists. And this is important for binocular function. So if you look at just a, a response tracing of individual cells in the, in the primary visual cortex, this, over on this side, these so-called class number one respond strongly to one eye. Class number seven responds strongly to the other eye. And in between are cells that have progressively more binocular function. Um, under pathologic situations, for instance, in strabismus, but in this case, the situation, for instance, of a kid that is a cross fixator where there's no preference for one eye, what you see is, is an absence of these cells that respond to both eyes. Okay, so we, we're losing um, cells here in the middle. In a situation where, um, for instance, the left eye is deprived, um, where you have a situation of stimulus deprivation, for instance, you see that the size of these ocular uh, dominance columns is significantly reduced in the left eye. And so we see a shift of the whole curve towards the right. Now, um, it's thought that you know, generation of these ocular dominance columns initially is based largely on a genetic program and development. And that um, visual experience it leads to the formation of these different patterns um, during the, uh, the, the so-called critical periods. Now, uh, an image that is just really striking and kind of reflects these changes. Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, we, we discussed the fact that these are also, um, this is kind of a direct reflection of, of changes in function of these cells and, and the actual signaling of these cells. And we can see that architecture also changes in response to um, amblyopia. <coughs> so it's, there are functional and architectural changes. So this is just a very striking picture. These pictures are taken um, from uh, monkeys that were treated with um, radioactive proline in one eye that traced back to the visual cortex. <laughs> you can see in a normal monkey, these the, the lighter um, traces came from the, the proline uh, re reflect the areas of the cortex stimulated by the eye that was injected with the radioactive tracer. You can see that the bright bands and the dark bands are just beautifully, evenly distributed across here. And in the situation where um, the fellow eye was subjected to dep uh, stimulus deprivation, you can see, you know, this gross asymmetry in the width of the bands. Okay, so it, it's, it's obvious from kind of the, you know, the introduction that I gave that there are still, amblyopia is still a big problem, and there are some um, problems with um, our ability to, to treat it. So there are, there's definitely a need for some new ideas and um, uh, new treatments uh, for amblyopia. So kind of what, what is out there? Well, um, Active therapy is the idea that it's important for the amblyopic eye to be actively engaged when, when we're trying to get the visual cortex to uh, kind of pay attention and rewire uh, in response to this eye. So there's this idea of uh, perceptual learning where specific tasks can be set up and often these are kind of uh, computer-based uh, activities that specifically and repetitively ask patients to practice uh, specific tasks. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that uh, video games specifically, um, to suggest that video games can help uh, increase the responsiveness of amblyopia therapy. And it's been found that action games tend to do better than non-action games. And there was some discussion at the PDIG uh, meeting at the recent APOS uh, meeting that I, I was able to attend kind of the, the PDIG planning meeting there uh, that first person shooter games are supposed to have the best <coughs> results. So um, they're talking about thinking about, you know, designing, I don't know, something that where you're not shooting people, maybe shooting balloons or something like that, just to keep them really engaged in <laughs> games. Um, then there are a lot of, then there are reports of these uh, therapies that are more stimulatory you know, some of these are pretty interesting. Transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, 
We had a paper that we discussed in, in one of the uh, journal clubs on low level laser therapy where laser light was directed through the conjunctiva and sh onto the macula. Uh, pleoptics is a, a device that is kind of like a direct ophthalmoscope and it, the objective is to kind of bleach the peripheral retina and then stimulate the uh, macula with uh, light. And all of these have had some reports suggesting that they might enhance um, responsiveness to amblyopia uh, treatment. I'm going to kind of focus today on what is kind of a holy grail for amblyopia treatment. That's the ability to just take a pill and uh, help with amblyopia treatment. So I'm going to discuss kind of three different groups of uh, pharmacological treatment for amblyopia and what the evidence is that these drugs might have some effectiveness. Um, there's some support for the use of uh, SSRIs. Um, levodopa and carbidopa has been studied uh, most extensively in the literature. Um, the results seem to be somewhat variable, and we'll, we'll discuss this some more. It is the subject of an ongoing clinical trial. And in addition to levodopa, other dopaminergic supplements have been studied, uh, specifically this uh, citicoline, and it has, in small studies, shown a favorable result. There's also some studies to suggest that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors might be of some use, and, and uh, the use of uh, Aricept is the subject of an ongoing uh, clinical trial. And we'll talk about that briefly. All right, so first we'll look at uh, what evidence is there that SSRIs may be useful. And right now this, this comes from the, the basic science literature. So before we get into that, we'll just talk uh, uh, kind of at, at a global level about cortical inhibition during visual development. And there's a concept that um, before the critical period begins, cortical inhibition levels are too low to allow for the formation of ocular dominance columns. And that during development, inhibition actually has to cross two different thresholds in order to define this critical period. You have to have enough inhibition to allow for the pruning that is required for the formation of the ocular dominance columns. But in order to, to stabilize uh, cortical circuitry, you cross a second threshold and that um, makes it so that these ocular dominance columns are kind of set and that is kind of how the critical period ends. Now one particular uh, neurotransmitter, uh, gamma aminobutyric acid or GABA, is felt to be a very important inhibitory neurotransmitter in uh, cerebral cortex. And a recent study looked at direct modulation of GABA in the uh, visual cortex. And the way that was accomplished was a mini pump was implanted directly over the visual cortex of rats. And this mini pump um, injected a material uh, called MPA. This is the uh, proper name for it. It inhibits the activity of the enzyme responsible for synthesizing GABA. And so seven days after this mini, plant, mi mini pump was implanted, you can see the GABA levels were significantly decreased relative to control. And then they turned it off after seven days. And immediately the levels of GABA came up. So here they were able to really tightly control the level of expression of this neurotransmitter within uh, the visual cortex. So um, this is just kind of an outline of one of the experiments that was done here in this paper. So uh, this just depicts kind of the critical period for uh, the rat model system. And in this case, they implanted the mini plump at a stage that is well beyond the critical period. So this is essentially it, like an experiment in adults. And then they subjected these uh, mice to monocular deprivation. So in a normal situation, here we're looking, this is similar to what we were looking at before with the response of individual cells, and this is kind of the ocular dominance score within the visual cortex. In the normal situation, um, monocular deprivation in adults doesn't shift the ocular dominance because there is no plasticity in adults. And you can see this is just a cumulative uh, curve of ocular dominance scores. It's kind of a summary of, of these uh, graphs here. In the presence of this uh, 
GABA synthase inhibitors. So when we decrease GABA levels, we see a shift away from the occluded eye, and that's reproduced here. So this shows that by m directly modulating levels of the neurotransmitter, we now induce plasticity in adult um, mice, or rats, actually, in this study. So um, there's some evidence that if we can modulate this neurotransmitter, we can change uh, plasticity of the visual cortex. However, there, there are some problems with um, direct targeting of GABAergic signaling, there's specific concerns over proconvulsive side effects, and so there's not a really a great drug to think about for modulating GABA directly right now. However, indirect modulation of GABA signaling may be possible. So um, these uh, inhibitory interneurons in the visual cortex that are GABAergic signaling are known to be modulated by brainstem uh, pathways that use other neurotransmitters, including noradrenaline, serotonin, and acetylcholine. So um, we know that we have medications, the SSRIs, that already target serotonin. So a uh, study was done to see if we can utilize these neuromodulatory pathways to kind of get at this inhibitory uh, circuitry within the visual cortex. So the, the experiments that were done were a long-term monocular deprivation <coughs> that spanned the critical period. And then towards the end of this monocular deprivation, well beyond the critical period, this is essentially in, in adults, uh, they were treated with um, an SSRI or with a control. And kind of midway between this treatment, this eye was opened and kind of a patching type therapy was uh, initiated. And then when that was completed, uh, they had some measures of visual function. Okay. These are actually just lid uh, suturing in order to uh, do the deprivation and the patching. And this long-term, this was considered long-term treatment with an SSRI was four weeks in this model. What was found that if you look at measures of visual acuity, first of all, in control mice, where you're just treating with a, uh, a placebo, you see that the deprived eye loses visual acuity and that um, you know, th that's uh, just stimulus deprivation amblyopia. However, treatment with fluoxetine uh, restored this visual acuity and that was found whether the visual acuity was measured using electrophysiologic mechanisms or using behavioral measures. Okay. And they went ahead and looked also specifically at GABA levels within the visual cortex and found that, yeah, it looks like modulating these brainstem pathways indeed did change um, the levels of GABA within the visual cortex. So this mechanism appears to act through this inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this is an exciting initial result because we do have SSRIs that are available, although, you know, the use of SSRIs, of course, is is kind of controversial in children and young adults. There are uh, specific concerns about their use, but um, this is a, a new area to think about for sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's known about levodopa. So levodopa um, is, a, is, is a dopamine analog. It's a precursor to dopamine. It needs to be decarboxylated in order to be converted to dopamine. Dopamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, but levodopa does. And um, it's, it's used in conjunction with um, carbidopa because that's a decarboxylase inhibitor that the inhibitor does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So it prevents the drug from being converted to dopamine in the peripherally, but allows dopamine to cross the blood-brain barrier, and, uh, or levodopa to cross the blood-brain barrier and act uh, within the central nervous system. So, um, Dopamine was initially postulated to be a candidate neurotransmitter for treatment of amblyopia based mainly on findings that it's expressed in retinal tissue and that there were alterations in BEP and ERG signaling in Parkinson's disease. This was back in the 70s and 80s. The initial study for the use of levodopa in amblyopia was published in 1990 and it had nine patients um, with amblyopia that were treated with a combination of levodopa and a different um, decarbo peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor. And then contrast sensitivity and scotoma size were measured uh, shortly after administration of this combination drug. Uh, 
And they found evidence for improvement in contrast sensitivity and scotoma size. And this is uh, one of the figures from that paper, uh, just comparing the scotoma size for the nine patients before and after levodopa treatment as compared to placebo. So you can see kind of a, you know, these scotomas are smaller in most of these patients on the levodopa side and really not changed in the placebo side. So since that time, there have been several studies looking at levodopa use in uh, amblyopia. Most of the studies have been relatively small, and a lot of them have looked at uh, short-term results with levodopa. And regression has been seen commonly. After you stop the medication, there's, there's been, um, in many of these studies, evidence of, of regression. But, you know, enough studies that have a positive result to suggest that there may be something here. So uh, PDIG, this is the Pediatric Eye Disease Interest Group. Um, it's like a, it's a collaborative group um, within pediatric ophthalmology, which is really just a fantastic group for, for designing and um, carrying out uh, clinical studies in pediatrics, has already completed an initial levodopa safety study. And this enrolled uh, 33 children aged 8 to less than 18 years old. The inclusion criteria included vision in the range of 2050 to 2400, specific history of strabismus or, and or anisometropia. These patients had to be carrying out patching therapy for at least two hours a day at the time of enrollment and have shown uh, no visual improvement, kind of a stable situation in the amblyopic eye at that time and their vision in the fellow eye had to be better than 2025. So uh, this is the way the study was designed. Patients continued the patching that they had to uh, be uh, doing at the time of enrollment, and they were split into two groups, high dose and low dose. Um, they continued this dosage for eight weeks, and during that time period, they had uh, some clinic visits and some phone calls to kind of assess any side effects that might be um, related to the treatment. Then they tapered the levodopa over one week, and then they had their final primary outcome visit. And then 10 weeks later, they had a final follow-up visit. So what did this uh, study show? This is kind of a large table. We're just going to kind of focus down here on the results. First of all, these are the columns that would show that they uh, worsened in terms of their vision, and there was, al there was almost none that worsened. There were several patients that, that did better. Um, at the four-week dose, this is right in the middle of their levodopa treatment, we saw that there was kind of a, a um, you know, mild trend towards some improvement, and this 95% confidence interval did not cross one. Nine weeks later, this is right after the point that they've completed, or nine weeks after initiation, so this is right at the point that they completed the taper. The effect was a little bit stronger and 10 weeks afterwards where they were just treating with patching that they'd been off the levodopa for 10 weeks, we see kind of a, a regression in both groups, but still a result with some improvement um, that no, where the 95% confidence interval did not cross one. In terms of adverse side effects, um, these were not considered to be serious. They were headache, uh, cold type symptoms, uh, rash, and nausea and vomiting in a few patients. And no patients discontinued the medication during the study. So based on this result, a decision was made to proceed with a larger randomized placebo-controlled study. And that's currently in the recruit, uh, recruition, or, or their uh, recruitment phase. Um, the overall design is very similar to the inclusion criteria that we already mentioned in the safety study, except the age range is a little more restricted, seven to 13 years. Um, at randomization, patients will uh, be placed in either a group that, um, where treatment consists of patching plus the levodopa carbidopa combination, and they decided to go with the larger, um, w with the higher dose based on the safety study because that was reasonably tolerated. Um, the other group is patching plus placebo. They're going to be treated for 16 weeks with some phone calls and visits interspersed between there and with a two-week taper, and that'll be the primary outcome. At that point, they'll asked whether or not there was improvement in vision in the amblyopic eye. If not, these patients will stop. If, if the answer is yes, they'll restart 
whatever treatment arm they're in for an additional eight weeks with another assessment. And in, in the uh, levodopa group, there'll be an option for the patient to proceed for an additional 13 weeks. Um, in the placebo group, they'll continue with the placebo treatment for eight weeks, and then they'll be unmasked and given the option to be inserted back up here into this arm and have the levodopa treatment, see how they do. Uh, the enrollment goals are, uh, the goal is to enroll at a two to one ratio with at least 92 patients in the, the treatment arm and 46 patients in the um, placebo arm. And at, at, the, at the PDIG meeting, they were saying that hopefully they'll, they'll reach this enrollment goal you know, within about a year or so. All right, so that's kind of where we are as far as levodopa. So what evidence is there to support acetylcholinesterase inhibitors? From the basic science side, um, there was a, a recent paper here uh, published a couple of years ago to, to support uh, the possibility of, of utilizing this pathway. A uh, beautifully designed genome-wide screen was carried out to look simply at factors that were expressed at higher levels in the visual cortex in adulthood relative to the critical period. And they used a transcriptome-based approach here. And one of the genes that they pulled out is a gene called LYNX1. And here we're looking at protein and mRNA expression levels of the gene within visual cortex. And this is just a stain for um, this LYNX1 protein within the uh, visual cortex. LYNX1 is an endogenous prototoxin that's similar to bungrotoxin in stink venom. And it binds to and inhibits uh, an acetylcholine receptor. So further experiments were carried out in LYNX1 knockout mice. And um, this is very similar to the results that we looked at in, in the rat model previously where um, well after the critical period, monocular deprivation was initiated. So um, in wild type mice, if you look at the white and the gray curve, we see again, you can't shift ocular dominance in adults. But in these LYNX1 knockout mice, you see a, a shift in ocular dominance. So that um, shows that genetic disruption of this factor allows for a shift in ocular dominance in adulthood. Again, here is a, a, another similar experiment to what we looked at before, looking at measures of visual acuity. In this case, they carried out long-term monocular deprivation within the critical period, and then looked at um, visual acuity measurements either in a knockout mice or in response to pharmacologic um, acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitor. And what you see, if we look first of all at wild type mice, of course, is um, that these mice get uh, amblyopia, right? They, they lose vision in response to long-term monocular deprivation. This arm here is um, just showing that if, if, the, if the mice uh, had the monocular deprivation um, stop, that is that eye opened for one month before they did the visual acuity measurements that they couldn't recover vision right, in the wild type mice. However, if we compare this column to the columns in the acetylcholinesterase treatment or in the knockout mice, we see that simply, op so in this case they didn't patch the fellow eye, they just opened up the eye that had been deprived. And you can see recovery of vision with treatment with either an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor or in the Lynx one knockout mouse. So these results suggest that targeting uh, acetylcholine neurotransmitter pathway can restore vision in amblyopia in this model. So in these experiments, um, the, the acetylcholinesterase uh, inhibitor uh, pharmacological treatment was carried out by performing physostigmine injections into the visual cortex. And we don't want to do this to kids. Um, but there are acetylcholine uh, inhibitors, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors that are available. Um, and one that's used is, is Aricept uh, that's, that's available clinically. So currently there's an open label phase one study that is enrolling. Patients greater than eight years of age, and this can include adult patients, um, the 
Patients that are less than age 17 will also receive patching therapy where the adult patients will just receive the Aricept. And the primary er outcome will be assessed at 22 weeks um, with a plan of 12 weeks on the Aricept and 10 weeks off. Um, there have been other trials uh, of Aricept in children, um, mostly in situations of like um, difficult to treat ADHD and uh, there have been also some other psychiatric um, uh, uh, diseases that where they've had some trials of, uh, of Aricept. And looking at some of those trials, it, it wasn't tolerated really well in kids. So there's some question about whether or not, you know, how, how this will really work. It's kind of some mixed results. Yeah, there were quite a few patients that actually ended up uh, stopping the Aricept in those studies. But this is, uh, you know, there's some evidence that disrupting this pathway might, um, might have some utility, so we'll, we'll see. This study is being run through uh, Boston Children's Hospital. All right, so just in conclusion, amblyopia is still an important cause of vision loss and a big problem, and there are better approaches. Uh, we do need better approaches to treating amblyopia. Um, I, I think it's true that, that pharmacologic and potentially genetically targeted treatments do hold promise for treatment for amblyopia in the future. But obviously, these treatments need to be refined and better targeted. And ultimately, ambly amblyopia is a, is a disease that needs to be attacked with a combinatorial approach that will probably lead to the best outcomes. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments. Yeah, I think that that's ultimately. Yeah, and there's been, and that, that's been one of the great things about the PDIC group is they've been able to design some nice studies to address those specific issues. You know, how much patching do you need? Do we see improvement with lower levels of patching? Do we see improvement with other um, uh, types of treatments like, uh, you know, atropine and things like that? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of options out there, and, and you don't necessarily have to try uh, to push for full-time patching. Oh, sorry, Dr. Warner. Okay, so Lynx-1 is a natural inhibitor of acetylcholine receptors. No, I think it's it's very very early in terms of the 
research in that uh, area. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, that, that could be a possibility in thinking about supplementing or treating patients that run into that situation. Can everyone hear me okay? I don't know if this is working. Good, thank you. 